Okay, well, this is, uh, I got cut off here. My, my recording just kind of, um, kind of crapped out on me. So let's continue with, uh, with Tukey and, uh, the White Sox here. Uh, as I was saying, I, he's got an in intriguing arsenal here with the four-seamer sinker split curveball. This is kind of a, a unique repertoire here. And, you know, whenever I see something like this, uh, you know, it's not a standard four-seamer, two-seamer, you know, slider change or something like that. When you throw in a split and a curveball, um, it, it, it's a really unique view for opposing offenses. So despite, you know, the fact that they did take apart a pretty good arm, a, a far higher upside arm in, in Lucas Giolito last night, um, I think Tuki could be in play simply due to what type of pitches the Mets are going to see from him tonight. Uh, I don't like the price tag. I don't like the strike one. I don't like the walk rate. I don't like the upside in terms of raw strikeout stuff here against right-handers, right? It's been pretty outsized here in the short sample against left-handers, pretty outsized to the downside. It's just 13%. Um, we can't really take a hell of a lot out of the realized values here because he's only got, what, 100 hitters that he's seen in total. So we got to be careful, but I do think if you need to land on somebody in this range, I'd rather play Tukey than Chase Silseth. I don't really want to play either of them, to be totally honest with you. We'll get to another guy here in a little bit uh, that I might rather play. Uh, but I do think Tukey could be in play in very contrarian builds if you need this and if you land on it. Um, I'm not going to go out of my way to do this, but this splitter curveball change up, or splitter curveball combination, I should say, is is playable, and uh, I think it could be a unique look for the Mets that they don't see very often. Um, most offenses baseball don't see this very often, splitter curveball, with a, a pretty balanced four seamer two seamer. It's obviously he's got to throw strikes, he's got to throw it near the plate. And I'm not jacked about a sub 10% swing strike rate. You know, let's not get it confused here. But I do think he could be in play. Um, because we're kind of starving for decent SP2 value here, and this arsenal, I think, you know, could uh, provide a little bit of that for us. Verlander on the other side, 8,800 for the Mets, 35% ownership. We got to be careful with this man. Similar to Carlos Rodon, um, you know, he's having trouble throwing strike one, and at 53% this season, he's got 13 full starts, 75 innings now. I think we just got to start accepting that he's not going to be the really elite 60%, 63% strike one guy that he has been in the past with 32, 33% chase. Where's the swinging strikes for Verlander? It's sub 10%. So in the same respect that I don't like any of those numbers, you know, that plate discipline profile for like a Tuki Toussaint um, or plenty of other guys that have sub 60% strike one, bad strike, you know, bad strike one down here at 50 percent even um you know i gotta kind of balk at this certainly balk at the ownership number for verlander but balk at the plate discipline profile for him as well at just 20 percent strikeouts you just need more to be eating this kind of ownership even though we are only on an eight game slate i do like verlander he seems to be uh figuring it out a little bit right and that his last several starts are a little bit more stabilized, okay, than his early up, down, up, down, up, down pattern that he was exhibiting for a while, but it's still kind of similar, right? Um, in his last six starts, he's got three outings where he didn't crack 17 points, one where he spiked for 28 against the Giants, and then in San Diego, he only struck out two in six innings and gave up two runs. So the strikeout stuff really isn't there, and if he gives up any production with this fly ball lean, then he might have a, a bit of a, a difficult time going deep enough into the game to help offset just the lack of raw whiff stuff. So that's what concerns me at, at north of 30% ownership. I, I know the projection is high, and I know the value score is very high. I'm going to have some Verlander, but he's similar to Carlos Rodon for me. I don't like eating a hell of a lot of ownership on guys that I have concerns are going to be able to get ahead of hitters and will commensurately elevate their own pitch count. Um so that concerns me here. I do think that Verlander, despite his pretty poor results, is even running a little bit hot. Certainly in the suppression, 375 ERA with a 4.5, 475 nearly XFIP. So that's a little um, suspicious here. Low strand rate, so this will probably tick up for Verlander. 
you know, we see some positive regression there. So overall, I think it's pretty fishy what we've got going on in the underlying metrics. Um, the arsenal is is sort of stabilizing with what he is historically thrown, but it's just the lack of strike one and and raw swing and miss. He's just not. A, he's got a 25% CSW. This is not uh, a tra- an attractive figure to be eating 35% ownership on a guy at this price tag at 8,800. So that's kind of where I stand with that. It's not that the contact numbers are really bad necessarily, um, but it's just the the ability to run deep into a game and eke back points when he gives up production. Even though this is a bad offense over here, the White Sox, they're still going to strike out. They don't create. They don't walk, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, but they can still take a part in arm that is going to have trouble throwing strikes, and Verlander is certainly qualifying in that respect. So um, I'm going to be careful with the ownership here and probably come in under on this um, and and maybe pivot on the mound a little bit in order to play some of the more chalky offenses. Not that I want to play any of the White Sox, but you can get leverage and, and play some of them. Go ahead and play Luis Robert. He's given up power to right-handers, 35% hard contact, and a neutral, roughly, but 15 ground ball to fly ball. Luis Robert, very heavy fly ball hitter, as is Jake Berger. So go ahead uh, and play you know, short two-man or three-man, even if you want to mix in Gavin Sheets, Benintendi, something like that. Um, I think that's okay. If you want to mix in a Tim Anderson, not super thrilled about that because he hits 12 ground balls per fly ball or something ridiculous. But um, leverage plays on the other side of this game against Verlander are very much in play, I think. Same thing with the Mets. Do I want to go out of my way to play them? Yeah, I mean, maybe, because the projections, we can't really ignore that. But uh, I do think Tukey is in play as well. Okay, let's uh, continue on here with Arizona and Atlanta. Ryan Nelson, Charlie Morton on the mound. Ryan Nelson, I just don't think I can do it here. Now, I do respect him a little bit more than um, I respect Zach Davies. He is fine. He's about an average Arsenal type of guy. Giving up a little bit on the slider here and certainly giving up a good bit on the curveball. Uh, but for the most part, the four-seamer change, that's a good velo delta. If the four-seamers break even, which it is, the change is likely to be break even as well. And it is. So um, overall, he's a, he's a pretty average arm. He's not a high upside DFS arm. And we kind of need that when we go after the Braves. So 6,700, I think he's overpriced for this matchup. And certainly for the offense that uh, he's likely to... Um, I mean, these guys are still just a total freaking buzzsaw over here. They they hopped on Zach Davies last night. We talked about how he could potentially be in play to suppress them a little bit. And, well, we also talked about how he could give up a nine spot in two and a third. And sure enough, he did exactly that. So, um, you know, this is a very dangerous list to be going after on a regular basis or fading for that matter. And I don't think tonight we're going to be able to do that, even considering their price tags. Uh, Cunha still at 65. Ozzy up above 6,000 now at 61. He he's just egregiously overpriced, but you know, like whatever, you got to play him in stacks. Austin Riley had the big night last night at 5,100. Talked about him being a really strong play. We were waiting for the power numbers to regress positively for him. You can still play him at 5,100. Matt Olson up to 62. He's still very expensive. Um, you know, low batting average and and strikeouts, but he he walks a good bit and of course hits the ball over the wall. That's fine. Sean Murphy up to 5,900. So if you want to play the top half of the Braves, uh, you're gonna have to double punt on the mound. We have some guys that could make that happen for you if you want to make a an Atlanta stack like that. They, I mean, go ahead. It's it's pretty gulpy though. Um, but you can't really deny that within 83. 83- three percent contact rate for ryan nelson like he's gonna have a difficult time keeping them off the board here and it's still very warm in atlanta and we talked about this This is a really high powered offense in a hitter's ballpark and really good weather against a guy that's not going to throw it by him so um i got no problems getting to atlanta once again you kind of every single day have to have some sort of atlanta exposure and Today's really no different. They're once again applied for a north of six-run total, and I got no problems with that. Um, He's efficient early in the count, just like Zach Davies. Doesn't have a lot of chase, just like Zach Davies. Doesn't walk people, just like Zach Davies, but gives up barrels. Not too dissimilar to Zach Davies, but uh, a big barrel rate north of 10%. That's that's worrisome here. Um, Slightly more fly ball lean here for Ryan Nelson, and that's not something we want to play around here. Uh, play around with here against the Braves. So, yeah, go ahead. You can get to him, um, but you have to play two or maybe even three of the guys down at the bottom half of the lineup. Um, 
they did just call up a young prospect for us wall for them uh, since Sammy Hilliard hasn't really proved all that. Yeah, I mean, he hasn't got a lot of work uh, since the early season um, appearances that he, he received. So they're going to give Forrest Wall a little bit of a look. He's a stone min, so he's certainly going to be pretty popular in Atlanta stacks today because he makes everything work. Uh, it's very viable going after some Ryan Nelson here. I'm going to leave him on the shelf at 6,700. Charlie Morton on the mound for the Braves, 91. I mean, yeah, it's fine, Like I, but I hate going after Arizona. We talked about this yesterday. Charlie Morton is is getting ground balls too, but they took apart um, Elder last night, did like something terrible. And like, I don't really want to do it. Like I, I don't want to play pitchers against Arizona. This is a very dangerous offense. And when they're seeing the baseball, notably like Christian Walker, when he's not striking out and, and, and making good contact, like Lord is has gone on a really hot streak this season. Evan Longoria has been fantastic. Um, and the, sort of lower upside guys, Alec Thomas, Jake McCarthy down at the bottom of the lineup, they make wraparound stacks, cheap stacks happen for you because you still got to pay for Cattell Marte, Corbin Carroll, and at least at this point, Christian Walker. Um, so I've got no problem playing the D-backs again. I've talked about this a couple of times this season with Charlie Morton. He's only got one good pitch, and it's a curveball. It's a very good pitch. Let's not get it confused. But when, if and when this curveball is bad... He will get taken apart because he has nothing else that that's even remotely, you know, like marginal here. The four seamer is bad relative to league average. Two seamer gets absolutely blasted here, so we can't go to either of those with any, um, you know, outsized confidence. Same thing with the changeup. Naturally, going to be bad if these if the fastball mix is is bad as well. So sure, he's got a little bit of plus value on the slider, but it's kind of a slurve. Uh, not necessarily a true slider here. Um, and if that curveball is bad, the slider's probably going to be bad too. So all of a sudden, he didn't have anything to work with that's equitable relative to the league average. And you're going against a an offense over here that is incredibly dangerous. Um, so I got no problem playing Arizona once again, going after Charlie and getting leverage on the field here. I'm much more attracted to a lower ownership figure on Charlie than something like Carlos Rodon or uh, a Verlander, for example. However, I'm still concerned. You, you need more than one good pitch, man. And, you know, he's got good strikeout stuff to the left side. It's going to be able to keep Jerry Perdomo, Tel Marte, and Corbin Carroll off the board a little bit. Certainly McCarthy and Alec Thomas, they're going to whiff. Um, but to the right side, he's given up production in spades here. 267 batting average, not super high number. 311 Woba, not a super high number either. 120 ISO, not terribly concerning, but 37% hard contact is a little bit notable, right? 22% line drive rate, that's notable. So if he hangs curveball here, uh, this is one of the few teams in baseball you know, that can really take some good professional at-bats and, and make him pay and make him throw strikes. If he hangs, hangs any of this curveball, just doesn't have doesn't have it early, I, I, I would not be surprised if Arizona jumps on him a little bit. Um, and so I want to be careful with the high ownership on him too. So I, as you can tell, I've kind of got a theme going. I want to come in under on a lot of these guys here. The, the matchups for them just are not excellent, and they've got concerns for me. Um, of the three guys that are popular here that we talked about so far, Charlie Morton is the one I'm most attracted to. But I think he's probably got the worst matchup of the three, to be quite honest. Uh, I really, really respect Arizona. I've been talking about them all season long. Super, super dangerous lineup uh, to be getting outside exposures with pitchers against. So uh, that's kind of how I'd like to play this. I'm going to come in under on Charlie. Uh, Charlie on Charlie. I'll have a little bit of him. Uh, I think the price tag's okay for him in general. Of course, the projection and the value score. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, it, it's it's dangerous going after. Um, you know, pitchers in in this game here. I would not be surprised to see another real crooked number from both of these teams put on the board again tonight. Okay, Washington and the Cubs. Trevor Williams, no thanks. Um, I just can't do it. However, we're kind of starving for somebody to play down here in this range if we're going to play somebody, and that kind of could put him in play. He doesn't get beat up with a lot of hard contact here. He's pretty efficient early in the count. Doesn't walk a lot of guys. He's not going to throw it past anybody. So that's obviously a concern, right? Just 8% swing strikes here, 23 and a half percent CSW. That, like, let's not get excited about this. But 6,500 puts him in play because he does still suppress uh, a lot of hard contact. Now, he will 
float the baseball a little bit here with the four-seamer, two-seamer. He hangs curveballs quite a bit, and this changeup is not the same value that it was historically. So when he throws this righty-righty change, this is basically an 83-mile-an-hour fastball for him, and it gets hit over the wall. And sure enough, despite a lack of hard contact to right-handers, still 2.2 homers per nine and a 248 ISO allowed. Now, he's running a bit cold here in that... Um, you know, he's got a roughly average, you know, 215 or so realized ISO with a 203 X ISO, right? So maybe running a tick, tick and a half cold there. Uh, same thing in the WOBA department, about 350. He's running you know, right in line, give or take with that, with the X WOBA. Um, a 273 XBA and right in line with that. So power wise, perhaps running a, a tick cold. Um, you know, these aren't good figures by any means whatsoever, but he does have some outside strikeout stuff above average at least 24 percent to the right side of the plate so it will, it will hang some and he will give up a little bit of pop here um does that put some of the cubs in play well yeah of course i mean they put up a 17 spot last night Do you really want to be going after them a team hoping that they do something similar well of course you don't need them to put up 17 um but trevor williams is a serviceable enough arm that he could keep them off the board in that respect. So do I want to play him? No, I do not. Do I think it's okay to play 6% of him and get double the field? Uh, yeah, I do think that's okay because we don't have anybody else that you really want to play down here, uh, as I mentioned. So um, it puts him in play. But uh, let's go ahead and get to the Cubs again, too. I think you can play both sides, of course, because Mike Talkman leading off still is 2800 I like They need to raise his price here because he's been great uh, from the leadoff. Um, both like Nico seen a price drop, Chris Burrell down to 4,300. He'll probably be up near the top of the lineup as well. Same with Ian Happ, say Suzuki down in the six. He's still cheap. Um, you know, Bellinger at 4,400. All these guys make, make constructions where you do want to get to some of the more expensive guys up at the top, like a Rodone, like a Verlander, uh, et cetera. And more popular guys, they, the Cubs, really do that for you. Unfortunately, they're going to be pretty popular here. So I'd kind of like to play the leverage game on the other side and play a little bit of Trevor Williams, come off of the Cubs a little bit, and and perhaps uh, balance my exposures elsewhere with some of these other offenses. Um, so I think that's kind of where I am right now. You know, let's not get carried away. I don't, I'm not jacked about playing Trevor Williams or anything, but I, I do think he is in play, um, you know, down in this range just because there's not a lot of other guys. Kyle Hendricks at 7,200, he's also kind of in play for me. And in seven at, in the 7K range, I think I do want to play a little bit of him. Uh, I really, really love this changeup. I hate this strikeout matchup. Once again, we're probably going to see some offense from a lot of these, um, you know, against a lot of these sort of mid-range arms here because they don't, they don't strike anybody out. Kyle Hendricks, however, is by far the best arm of any of the guys that we've talked about, certainly in this range. And he's got by far the best pitch here in the changeup. Now, the two-seamer change, that does keep him down, does induce a little bit of soft contact, right? Certainly when he throws it righty-right, he's got a 25% soft contact rate to the right side, just a 27% hard contact rate. So I don't really want to be stacking any of Washington here. Uh, I think this changeup is has a... a pretty respectable probability to take apart a lot of the left-handed hitters and certainly the righties too uh, for the Nationals. They don't hit for power as it is, right? Just a 130X or a 130 ISO rather, 30% hard contact, hell of a lot of ground balls here. Um, now Kyle Hendricks at this point in his career, not nearly as heavy in the ground ball stuff because he's moved a lot of the sinker usage over to the four-seamer and he, he gets it up in the strike zone a little bit more. Um, so the batted ball profile does play into Washington's hands a little bit here, but even still, it's a changeup that I'm really attracted to here. Um, I think this is a very, very good pitch. I've talked about this kind of ad nauseum this season with him, and I think in this in this range, certainly at sub five percent ownership, he's he has to be in play. He has 20 in the tank, 25 in the tank. He could go seven innings and keep them completely off the board here. Kyle Hendricks still has that. So. Um, I think that's playable. He's super efficient. He doesn't walk anybody. He's efficient early in the count, I should say. And he has really good chase, and that's coming from this changeup. Um, look at all the called strikes here. 21% called strike rate is insanely high. Doesn't have any swinging strikes, but once again, 
it strikes or strikes, and if uh, we got a CSW here pushing 28%, uh, that's a pretty damn attractive figure. I'd much rather play 7,200 Kyle Hendricks with a CSW of 28, 29% than a Justin Verlander with a CSW of 25%, for example, right? So uh, 3% strikes, 3% strikes. That's not negligible. Um, so that said, that's kind of where I stand on this game. Uh, I don't really want to play any Washington. I'm kind of off of the Cubs a little bit, even though they're very much playable against Trevor Williams, who does give up power still. Let's not get it confused. Um but I do think both of these arms kind of have to be in play here. Okay, let's move on to Detroit and Kansas City. Eddie Rodriguez, I want to play him as the most expensive guy here. He's not seeing near as much ownership as the other guys, and I'm not sure that's totally warranted here. Now, I have talked about several times this season where we got to be careful with the Royals uh, against left-handed pitchers. Yeah, against left-handed pitching, um, because they make so much hard contact still. And sure enough, yesterday they really took apart Tarek Skubal. Um, now, Eddie has a, is far better than, than Tarek Skubal. Um, you know, we have to respect Eddie's arsenal and certainly Eddie's results this season. It was only Skubal's, what, third appearance here. Um, and he was probably bound to get taken apart eventually. Eddie, probably the same. He's still expensive. At 9500 I'm not jacked about the price tag on him. I'd much rather he were 8500 um, I think that makes for some really interesting tournament pivots if he were 8500 Nevertheless, he's only, what, 700 more expensive than Verlander, and he's seeing, what, 10 15% less ownership. So, yeah, sign me up. He's super efficient early in the count. This is a 10% delta between him and Verlander in terms of strike one, and you cannot overcome that. I don't care what kind of history you have as a high strikeout guy, and really the matchup doesn't really matter when you've got a 10% um, – First strike delta here. Uh, this is a very, very elite figure at 65%. We'd like to see, of course, a, a higher chase rate out of him at north of 30%. But he's still at 29% CSW himself with 27% aggregate Ks. Verlander's got half that. I mean, obviously, I'm exaggerating. So what I want to do is, is pivot up to some Eddie Rodriguez. I'm much more comfortable eating 20% on him against a far, far worse offense. Right? The White Sox are bad, but... The Royals are pretty bad, too. And as a matter of fact, in you know, a park-adjusted WRC Plus here, they do create against left-handers at a 91 WRC Plus versus the 85 that the White Sox create uh, against right-handers. Nevertheless, uh, they're very similar offenses. Um, it is you know, kind of scary that the Royals do hit for 35% hard contact. But are we really concerned about that with Eddie Rodriguez when he only gives up 28%? This is a damn, damn good aggregate here at 28% uh, against both sides. He gets elite ground balls so far in the short sample to the left side, so I'm not worried about any lefties here. They've got a lot of lefties who do make a lot of hard contact. Uh, Salvi probably still out again today. Um, I have to keep an eye on that. And really, the, the best hitter over here from the right side is Bobby Witt. Mikel Garcia kind of rounding into his own a little bit against lefties. They've been leading him off, of course. Fermin behind the plate. Eddie Olivares has historically good numbers against le uh, lefties, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Matt Duffy, they platoon him pretty heavily as well. So they're going to platoon, but am I really worried about this? I don't know. 236 batting average, 280 Woba, and a 123 ISO against right-handers this season with a 26.5% K rate. So I'm not concerned about that. Uh, necessarily, it'd be a kind of a slight buck 15, buck 20 ground ball to fly ball lean hitter that I were I would like to target if I were going to do that. It's kind of like a Bobby Witt territory. Um, perhaps a, a Mikel Garcia as well. Uh, that's fine. You know, split adjusted here. I'm looking on the other monitor uh, to see if I could pull up this these numbers here briefly. Um, yeah, you're looking at uh, Mikel Garcia. He's got a buck 25 ground ball to fly ball against uh, left-handers this season. Um, everybody else is kind of like a fly ball lean. Bobby Witt is a you know a 090 ground ball to fly ball. Matt Duffy is a dead neutral ground ball to fly ball, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I think this puts Eddie in play a little bit. You know, the 9,500 price tag against those batted ball profiles are a little bit, um, you know, make me a little bit squeamish, I should say. But uh, I think he's very much in play here. I need more value out of the change to get, like, super thrilled about it. Uh, but for the most part, it's the cutter that's really keeping all of the right-handers off uh, off the board. So uh, I'm okay playing a good bit of Eddie here tonight and going after the Royals. Um, that's kind of how I'd like to pivot up in the upper price range. Uh, 5500 for Ryan Yarborough going on the mound for them. Um, 
for Kansas City, that is. I think he's got to be in play just because he's 5,500. And as a matter of fact, he's actually stretched out in that, uh, what, in his last inning, or his last appearance, I should say, he went six innings against Cleveland, struck out five, only gave up one run. And I think that's pretty damn respectable for Ryan Yarbrough. Historically, not a very high upside strikeout guy. We've always had problems. Uh, we were never really able to play him because he was always eight freaking thousand. And he was always come in and throw two, three innings out of the bullpen for Tampa. Well, Kansas City's got him now back into rotation. He's going to stick with the absence of Grinky and of Brad Keller. Uh, Keller, who had been horrific. Grinky, who was hurt. Um, he's going to be in the rotation here. And he'll be stretched out enough at 5,500. I think this has to put him in play against the Tigers. Once again, like they're a very dangerous team against left-handed pitching too. 96 WRC plus, just a 22% above average strikeout rate for an offense. 236 batting average, not overly thrilling. 161 ISO, 37% hard contact, however. So that's really what would attract me to some Detroit pieces. They've got some guys here, of course, Andy Abanez, Matt Vierling, Torque. That hit left-handers very well. Even though Javi Baez had a good night either last night or maybe the night before, he still stinks. Uh, and he's still overpriced, 4400 Don't really want to do that. Um, so I'm not super thrilled about playing a lot of offense in this game necessarily. I don't want to go after Eddie. I still really respect him. And the Royals are bad. And I don't necessarily want to go after Ryan Yarbrough here. He's always been a pretty respectable arm. He's got a damn good cutter. He always has had a, a really good cutter. It's a changeup that's not been great. Um, that he, he doesn't have a lot of swing and miss because he he throws a lot of this, you know, full 25% of this cutter here. And we talked about this has never been a swing and miss pitch, but he induces a lot of soft contact. This is why he's always been attractive. It's the soft contact rate. Um, but at 5,500, the lack of raw strikeout stuff is very well priced in here. So I think we can take some punts on some Ryan Yarbrough to outperform this price tag and this projection. This projection looks a little bit low to me. I think it, given that he's fully stretched out, uh, I think he very much has six innings in the tank here. And at 5,500, that could absolutely be serviceable uh, as a, an SP2 if you need to get a little bit contrarian uh, or want to play Atlanta, for example. So um, I think he's the one that's going to unlock all of that. And at at two and a half percent ownership right now, I like I've got no problems getting here. Of course, he's not going to wow us in the plate discipline numbers or anything like that. Uh, but that you know he's not 8800 like Verlander. Like these numbers are basically identical outside of the strikeout rate to Verlander's, and he's 5500. Verlander's 3300 more expensive and 15 times as popular. So I mean, seems like a pretty easy decision here, uh, if you ask me. Um, if you know, we're comparing them just those uh, those few metrics there. In any case, um, mostly pitching here in this game for me. I'd like to target some other, you know, higher upside weather games. Um, it's only 80 degrees here at Kauffman, and this is a, still a pitcher's ballpark. It only plays up offense when it's really, really warm and really humid, and that's not necessarily the case today. It's only about 80 degrees in, in KC tonight. So um would like to target some pitching here. I think both of these guys are in play. Obviously, the favorite is Eddie. Uh, but I think Ryan Yarbrough has to be in play as well. Okay, last game here. Kenta Maeda and Luis Castillo, the mound for the Twins and the Mariners. Uh, this is a, the one sort of late-night hammer that we've got. Uh, all the other games starting at uh, 8 Eastern or prior. Um, this is the sort of natural start time for the for games in Seattle, I suppose, out here on the West Coast. Kenta at 7,800. He was bad in his last outing against Oakland, which is kind of frustrating. Um, you know, it's a, a really good matchup, of course, because Oakland is terrible. But we talked about this, uh, I believe, in in the in that last start for him. That there's some variance sometimes with Kenta Maeda. He comes out in really bad matchups, and he totally blows everybody away. Um, and sometimes in in really really good matchups, he comes in shits the bed a little bit. And that was kind of what he did against uh, Oakland, right? Um, he came out after his well, in his first start back. After coming off the DL, right, uh, he had Detroit and was excellent, and he was serviceable. He survived against Atlanta. Um, you know, we kind of throw that start out because not many people survive against Atlanta, but he was fantastic against Kansas City, and then he came out and shit the bed against Oakland. So um, there's variance there with Kenta, and, I mean, it's, it's not like – I mean, we've seen that a, a few times this season where a lot of guys get a really, really good matchup, and Oakland – comes out and just kind of takes them apart a little bit and ruins your DFS day. Um, 
Now, Kenta Maeda, I'm really attracted to sub-10% ownership here. I hate playing popular pitchers. I think you guys know this um, with me by now. That I think there's very reasonable... There's so much variance in baseball, and certainly with starting pitchers, even though they're the most projectable of any of the players, there's a ton of variance with them still because, well, they're some of the most enigmatic creatures on the planet, starting pitchers. So... um, I don't like playing them when they're very popular. And where we've got that same dynamic here. Luis Castillo seeing 40% ownership. And Kenta seeing just 10 with a $1,500 price delta. Yeah, obviously the matchups are a little bit different, but well, maybe not. There's a huge, huge projection delta. Kenta Maeda is, I would say, not nearly as high upside, certainly, as Luis Castillo. But... I think the downside is just the same here, or relatively similar. Um, Kenta Maeda's got a really damn good split. He's always had excellent off-speed and, and breaking stuff here with the splitter slider. It doesn't throw a lot of the curveballs. It's supposed to just been a show-me curve. Um, his main weakness throughout his career has, has really been you know, lack of elite fastball stuff. Uh, it's never been the secondaries for Kenta Maeda. And that's really similar with a lot of the East Asian type of pitchers, right? Otani. You've seen plenty of, uh, like, Tadeo Nomo, you know, types of guys, um, you know, over the years that have had just really, really good sort of secondary pitches. And, well, they teach that at, over there. Um, it's the fastball stuff. They don't really throw all that hard. Kenta Maeda, not really any different. That certainly at this point in his career, he's throwing just 90, and everybody's going to be able to square up 90. You could square up 90 in high school, right? So um, that is what really increases the variance for Kenta Maeda a lot of the time. 7,800 here against Seattle. Well, this is a bad offense, man. Like, dead break even in literally every single metric, way, way below average in the batting average category they're down here with the Padres and whoever else we talked about earlier um what was it like the Giants or the White Sox or I forget in any case they only hit 225 as a team walk at a 9% clip strike out at a 25 26% clip this is what second highest split adjusted number on the day to well Minnesota on the other side um 32 and a half percent hard that's average buck 60 ISO that's average etc cetera, etc cetera. this offense stinks we talk about this literally every day with them Against right-handers, they're very much attackable. It's sub-10% ownership. I have no problem going after getting good outsized exposure to Kenta Maeda. I love this splitter, man, and a good split is a super difficult pitch for opposing offenses to square up. So uh, he's going to induce a lot of swing and miss here, and that hasn't really changed. All of these numbers actually do still include that one really, really bad outing for Kenta where he got blasted, gave up 10 in three innings against the Yankees, then went on the DL for a month and a half. Uh, two months, even. Um, outside of that, he's only had one really kind of super poor outing where he got taken apart. Um, he doesn't run super deep into games, elevates pitch count because he just throws some junk here. But he doesn't walk a lot of guys. He stays off the barrel for the most part. Uh, it's the fly balls I'm a little concerned here with um, that would give me some... some you know, a good bit of pause. Uh, I would like to get to a couple of, you know, ground ball type of lean. That's like a Ty France sort of guy. Um, Gino Suarez against righties, a little bit, 2,700. He had another bomb last night. Still has some power, even though he strikes out a lot. And Julio got a day off last night, should be back in there this evening. At 4,800, still still playable price tag. Everybody from Seattle is playable, so if you want to get there, fine. You're not getting a lot of leverage, though, so I think I'd rather side with Kenta Maeda here at 7,800. Um, I'd, mother, I'd much rather play Maeda than Kyle Hendricks, right, certainly in this price range, but uh, I think playing uh, both of them is pretty okay. 9300 for Luis Castillo. I like the price tag, number one. The I like the, mag, the matchup, of course, number two. I love the projection, of course, and the value score, definitely, uh, number three. I do not like the ownership. This is a theme for me today. Um, Luis Castillo's changeup value is getting worse here, and we've talked about this in all of his last... Uh, starts when he's been on a main slate, and a, we've got a vid out for it. Um, you know, the the changeup is slowly but pretty consistently regressing back to his early career figures, and this is exceptionally concerning. He's now at this point giving up a full 209 ISO and 080 ground balls per fly ball here with 33% hard, 32% hard contact, 1.7 homers per nine to the left-handers. 
these are Cincinnati numbers for Luis Castillo, and this is a big problem. This is how he gets taken apart, and in, in his last eight starts, too, at very high price tags, we've had to take a lot of risk with him with a bad pitch that he uses a lot. The coaching staff over here in Seattle, they need to get him right with his pitch or get him to stop throwing it so damn much. Move it over to a cutter or something because he's given up way too much production here. And it's only a six mile an hour or eight mile an hour delta. I mean, math is hard um, to the fastball. So we when the value on the change is this bad and it comes in as flat as it does with the three quarter release point that he comes in with. You have to have more velo delta, and you have to depress the spin rate on the changeup in order to induce a lot more swing and miss on the pitch and not give up so much power. And Luis Castillo doesn't do that. So at 40% ownership, I am absolutely coming in underweight on this. I recognize that the upside is very high in this particular matchup because this is the Twins and they're bad. But I think this is a very easy leverage spot to go get some of the Twins. Eddie Julian's still very cheap at 3000 He is excellent numbers against right-handers. This is a really good batted ball matchup for him. Um, same thing with Alex Kirilov. He's got good numbers against right-handers historically. He's 2,200. You need a late-night first base hammer piece. Uh, go ahead. I got no problems with that. Same with Max Kepler. Has always hit right-handers very well. He's 2,600. Been seeing the baseball pretty well recently. I don't want to play Byron Buxton because he sucks. But he's 5,200 and you want to play him in stacks? Yeah, go ahead. You're not going to leave him off of stacks necessarily if you're stacking the twins for leverage here um so yeah i've got no problem playing carlos correa as well at 4200 this i'm okay with this even though they're likely to strike out a lot um i think there's a good opportunity to get leverage here i think this ownership figure is a bit too high at least for me with how bad this changeup is i know everything else is pretty good and that's what's going to allow him to survive right the play discipline numbers in aggregate are fantastic 15 percent swing strike rate 29 30 percent csw 32 percent chase excellent strike one no walks it's the barrels from this bad changeup and the three-quarter release point that he comes in with when he throws his two-seamer as well that have me concerned he gives up hard contact to right-handers too um that's throwing a a little bit of a flat four seamer uh, as well. And the slider, you know, it, it's just break even. So there's some concerns for me, at least at eating 40 and I mean, he'll be 50% in a lot of stuff tonight. So um, I think that's a, a pretty prime leverage spot to come off of a little bit of this, even though I do really like the price tag and, and all of the projections and everything, of course, well, you got to have some definitely against the twins. You got to have exposure to anybody that plays twins. Um, however, I mean, you can balance it a little bit and get a little bit uh, contrarian here. Cause like really what's it, your most popular build here is going to be like the giants with Luis Castillo and Verlander or something. And you know, with like a, a two man Atlanta or something, that's going to be a very popular build tonight. And I'd rather just go elsewhere and see if I can get to some other offenses and maybe some other pitchers too. Um, so that's kind of how I want to approach this game a little bit, play some leverage of the twins. And, but I do want to play, of course, a little bit of the pitching. Um, I think everybody is is kind of here, is kind of in play here. Less so in the Mariners. Would really just prefer some of the slight ground ball lean guys that can make some hard contact against Kenta Maeda. Uh, but I'd have to side with him at the low ownership figure. Uh, okay, so that's it. Um, this is going to be probably two vids unless I figure out how to splice together the the two that I have. In any case, let's go over a review real quick. Uh, you Darvish and Josie Barrios pitching mostly here for me. Respect both of these arms. Think they're at their respective ownership figures. I mean, down here at 10%. Yeah, sign me up for this. Uh, I think they're very viable SP2s. You can anchor with both of these guys. Use them as SP1s as well if you'd like to. Um, Yankees, Angels, uh, Carlos Rodon, yeah, he's going to be popular. Get, so get, let's get a little bit of exposure, but let's pump the brakes a little bit uh, in this particular matchup. It's still a very good offense against left-handed pitching. Carlos Rodon's only had, what, two starts so far? Um, it's fine at, at, at his price tag. I think the ownership is maybe a little bit aggressive here in the early going, at least for my liking. Um, so I think that's kind of how I'd like to play it. You want to play the Yankees against Chase Silseth? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, stretched out enough to be a, a starter. I don't think he's in play at 7,000 because he's probably only going to go about four innings still. 
I don't really want to play the Yankees because their offense just stinks. But um, you know, that's kind of where I am. Mostly a write-off game for me, I think. Some Angels pieces to get some leverage. Of course, Otani, et cetera, et cetera. San Francisco and Cincinnati, offense only. Outside of some sh- very short Graham Ashcraft pieces and deep tournament stuff only. I think he's got upside at the 5,800. Probably rather play Yarbrough. But um, I think it's okay if you want to consider some Graham Ashcraft and mix him in, you know, 5% of your teams or whatever. I don't think that's horrible. But offense, definitely, if you can make Cincy stacks happen, yeah, go ahead. Uh, because nobody's going to play them because they're out of control, expensive. Uh, everybody's just going to go to Atlanta, and they probably should. We'll get to that in a sec. White Sox, Mets, you want to play some leverage against Verlander? Sure, no problem there. Uh, Tuki Tucson, I think he is also in play at 6,900 against the Mets, whose offense is bad, even though they took part a really good arm last night. I really like the split curveball combination here for Tuki. Um, don't like the price tag, don't like everything else, but uh, I think that Arsenal has to put him in play a little bit. So kind of off of offense there a little bit outside of leverage and the natural, you know, uh, Pete Alonso types. Frankie Alvarez behind the plate, etc. Arizona, Atlanta, offense again, let's do it. Uh, Charlie Morton, yeah, sure. I'm okay with him of anybody in this upper range since he's, you know, I'd rather just pivot it to Eddie, you know, uh, we talked about that a little bit, but uh, I think Charlie Morton's in play, but I do not like going after Arizona, and I try and minimize the amount that I do that. Uh, even, you know, with a good pitch that Charlie has, it is still just one pitch. Um, so that makes him very vulnerable at above 9,000. He's super variant, and I think he can get taken apart here a little bit by a very, very good offense. Same thing with Atlanta. No Ryan Nelson for me. Just can't do it. He's overpriced, and this is a horrible, horrible spot. Got to go right back to Atlanta. Um could you come off of them? Yeah, I mean, sure, but you got to have exposure in some manner literally every single night to this team. Washington and the Cubs, no Washington here for me tonight. Maybe some Trevor Williams, I guess, but, like, blah. Um, Kyle Hendricks, too, 7,200. Not super thrilling to play him, but in the 7K range, I think that's kind of where I'm going to land with it. I really like the change up here, and I think it's a fine matchup for him uh, to suppress and, you know, maybe eke out a little bit of strikeout stuff. I think it's fine, 7,200. Nobody else to play in that range. Yeah, you can play the Cubs, definitely. You can always stack against Trevor Williams, uh, but they're going to be pretty popular, so you got to balance that. Detroit and Kansas City, really kind of off of offense for the most part here outside of one-offs, I think. Eddie, mostly, and a little bit of Yarbrough, too. I think 5,500 is a bit too cheap for him. I think he's got six innings and maybe not some strikeout upside, but certainly some suppression upside and some soft contact ground ball type of contact um, in the tank for him. At 5,500, I think it's a a little bit too cheap. Minnesota, Seattle, same thing sort of here. Pitching obviously in play, but I want to get some leverage against Luis Castillo. I think 40% is too high, Um, at least for my taste. I do like Castillo, but uh, he's got a bad changeup, man, and you need a better out pitch against left-handers if you don't throw a cutter. So, uh, Kenta Maeda, I'd like to play at, what, you know, 8,800 as well. Um, So I think he's very much in play, and you want to play some correlated teams with Minnesota. That's a pretty interesting late-night hammer, I think, in deeper tournament stuff. Um, you could probably convince me that that's a, a pretty respectable 20 max play as well. So um, very little Seattle outside of like some ground ball hitters, guys that make hard contact, Julio, Ty France types, something like that. Uh, okay, so that's it. We are done here. Um, keep an eye out for projections and ownership updates. Sorry about the split vids here. I don't know what happened. My, uh, my first vid just kind of um, crapped out on me. So uh, got to bounce between two things here, uh, unless I could figure out how to... Um, you know, splice them together, in which case, ignore everything I just said. So, good luck to everybody here on the main slate. Once again, keep an eye out for projections for the early slate as well. We will be pushing those. And good luck on the 8-gamer here tonight. Good luck.